Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to 60 Minutes in Space for July. Um, we've got a lot to cover tonight, so uh, I think we'll, we'll jump right in. I'm Steve Lee, one of the space scientists here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, and tonight I'll be joined with uh, Dr. Kachun Yu, um, the curator of uh, space science here at the museum. Uh, for those of you that are brand new, uh, 60 Minutes is all about uh, trying to delve into a handful of stories from the previous month or so that uh, have been in the news uh, concerning space exploration, space science, astronomy, things like that. So uh, both Katrin and I have uh, a number of stories tonight and uh, we'll go through those. Please uh, type in your questions into the into the chat window. And uh, at the end of our program, in uh, 45, 50 minutes, Katrin and I will uh, start going through the chat and uh, answering as many of your questions as we can. So uh, I think without further ado, I'll turn it over to uh, Katrin. Thanks. All right, thank you very much, Steve. Uh, my stories uh, today have to do with uh, looking for and observing um, planets outside of our solar system. And uh, so um, my first story um, will be about a bunch of debris disks that have been discovered around several dozen um, young um, solar systems. And, um, and these were found um, at a telescope um, down in Chile, Gemini um, Observatory South. Um, Gemini, um, of course, are the two twins, um, the constellation in the sky, and uh, there are a pair of telescopes, one in the northern hemisphere and one in the southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere is in Hawaii, and the southern one is in Chile. And so these observations were made at Gemini South, and uh, they used an instrument called the Gemini Planet Imager. And this is um, inside the, um, the telescope. And um, so that big blue um, giant thing is kind of the bottom of the telescope. The, um, the mirror is um, about 25 um, feet across. So this is a very large telescope. But all of those boxes that you see at the bottom make up uh, the Gemini Planet Imager, or GPI. And here is a, uh, a close-up um, image of that. And what this, um, what GPI does is um, it helps block out the light from um, stars so that uh, because uh, the light from stars um, is extremely bright compared to the light um, from planets and from disks of gas and rocks and dust around young stars. And so in order to be able to image or take pictures of um, young planets and these debris disks around these young stars, you have to be able to block out the light and that's what um, all this instrumentation that we're seeing here does. But before we get um, into the results, what I want to do is talk about what we mean by these debris disks. And um, it turns out that um, you know, planets and stars all form from um, the same cloud of gas and dust that collapses into the star. And so um, most of that mass ends up in the central star but you have um, a fraction of that mass that piles up into a flattened um, torus or, or a disk um, that slowly um, accretes into, that slowly forms into planets. Some of that gas um, gets ejected out of the system. Some of that gas um, continues to accrete um, onto, the, um, um, onto the central star and um, and so over a course of um, just a handful of millions of years, um, a gas that was um, in a uh, interstellar cloud uh, can collapse to form a star and planets around that star. And here are um, some computer simulations showing what happens to that gas um, in that um, protoplanetary disk. And uh, so you can see that um, portions of the gas in that disk collapse through gravitational instabilities into denser regions. That's uh, those de um, sort of pinkish uh, nodules that are in orbit. And over time, more and more gas spirals in to those uh, protoplanets. 
And so um, as we continue through the simulation, you'll see more and more of the disk um, get evacuated. Um, you start seeing these bigger gaps and that's just because the, the gas in the disk is falling on to those, uh, those young planets. If we, um, here's another um, simulation um, showing um, very much um, the same thing, but here um, the, um, the scientists um, creating this computer simulation started off with, uh, with one uh, protoplanet. And you can see how that uh, protoplanet is drawing in gas from the disk. And as a result, it creates this um, sort of like a spiral wave that um, is sent outwards but you can also um, see gaps um, in the disk as a result of um, material being drawn onto the planet. Here is another similar um, simulation where they are including um, not just one uh, protoplanet, but multiple planets. And uh, what's really interesting here is that if you follow and watch the planets, they'll actually move um, as they interact um, with the gas in the disk. And they also interact gravitationally with themselves. And so, some of these objects will um, collide and merge together. And as they interact uh, gravitationally with the disk, um, the, their orbital distances um, change. And so um, some of them spiral closer in um, and they might also um, end up spiraling outwards. So what we see from these simulations is that when planets form around young stars, and this is probably something that happened with our sun and our solar system four and a half billion years ago, this is a really dynamic process where things are interacting with each other um, gravitationally. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, the masses of the gas and, and those protoplanets are constantly changing because they're uh, moving and spiraling um, into one another. All right. So one of the problems um, with trying to detect um, planets around stars or um, these debris disks is what we call the firefly and the searchlight problem. So if you imagine if there's a searchlight um, pointed up at the sky, that searchlight is super bright. And if, you, if you're trying to also spot a small firefly that's flitting um, next to it, that's almost impossible um, to see just because um, of a really powerful light source right next to the little tiny insect. And this is the same problem that we have in astronomy when we're trying to detect planets or observe planets around other stars. The planets can be billions of times fainter than the parent star, at least in the visible light that we can see. Um, and it turns out that um, if you observe in the infrared light, uh, the problem actually becomes a little bit um, easier because there's less of a contrast or there's um, less of a difference. But one of the tools that astronomers um, have is something called a coronagraph. And this is a um, attachment that you can um, build into a telescope that can block out the light from a central star and this is something, uh, for instance, we can observe um, here are comets that we see um, orbiting the sun. This is from the SOHO spacecraft. And uh, let me uh, replay this. You, um, you'll see the comets come in from the bottom um, slightly to the right. The sun is blocked out um, and the white um, circular line represents um, the, um, the diameter of the sun. So let me just go backwards and play this again. And you see two comets coming in as they orbit around the sun. And uh, you also see the corona or the atmos outer atmosphere of the sun um, sending out um, gas that, uh, that turns into the solar wind. So here's one case where we're able to um, block out the sun and see a comet. And here's um, another example. The, um, you see um, the comet moving from the, um, to the left of the screen towards the upper um, top. And that inset picture um, shows you a zoom up of what that comet looks like. And here again, um, we're only able to see the comet because we managed to block out the light from the sun. So we can um, do something similar um, with you know, ground-based telescopes uh, looking at stars elsewhere in our galaxy. And so here are some examples where, you know, in recent years, we've been able to um, use coronagraphs on um, very large telescopes um, in Hawaii and Chile and elsewhere. And here, um, the center uh, looks um, kind of weird because um, the, the coronagraph uh, has blocked out most of the light, but they also try to do a subtraction to remove the remainder of the light. 
And so the subtraction isn't completely perfect. And so you see um, some bright spots as well as some dark regions, but the features all around it, those arcs that you see around that um, bright star in the center that's been blacked out, those are real. So these are examples of uh, remnants of accretion disks around young stars. And the reason why we're seeing these big gaps um, in these disks is because uh, presumably there are uh, very young protoplanets that have swept up all the gas and the, and the dust. And that gas and dust have piled into those um, planets, leaving um, these um, large empty regions. And in this case, um, we can sort of imagine that the disk and the orbits of the gas and dust and the planets are not completely face on, but they're slightly tilted away from us or tilted um, um, towards us, depending on your, uh, what you think the perspective is. Um, because uh, uh, presumably um, all, all these orbits are, are circular. Here is yet another example. Um, in this case, um, HD 135344 B um, has um, a disk that's almost exactly face on. So we're seeing um, directly down into um, the, the poles of the star, the polar regions of the star. And here the coronagraph has blocked out almost um, all the starlight perfectly. So you don't see anything from the center at all. And here we see some nice spiral patterns in the, in the accretion disk, just like we saw in the uh, <coughs> and, um, and so let's uh, go on to um, the most recent observations, the, the one using GPI, the Gemini Planet Imager. And here are, are examples from um, six of those um, 26 um, objects that were observed or that um, were found to have um, debris disks. And, um, and, and so again, for the most part, um, you've seen um, disks that have been cleared out um, due to the planets. And so unlike um, some of those simulations where the planets were still growing, I think for the most part, um, these um, disks, um, you know, much of the gas um, has either fallen onto the star or um, has fallen onto these young planets. And uh, the, the one in the center uh, on the bottom, TWA7, is facing um, directly towards us. But um, three of the ones um, in the corner images, um, they're um, tilted plane on or, um, so that we're seeing um, them from the side. And so that's why uh, we see them sort of like a cigar shape instead of um, like a, a dinner plate. And um, the one uh, top center is um, not quite um, edge on. And then the one on the bottom left is, uh, is tilted more. And in all these cases, again, there's a big black um, blank spot in the center where the star um, should be. And that's just because uh, the coronagraph has subtracted um, all the starlight and um, um, the, the astronomers have also attempted to, um, to remove um, as much extreme, extraneous light as possible. So we think that um, these, um, de these debris disks, those um, toruses or those donuts that you see are very analogous to um, what's left over in our solar system. And so here is an animation showing our solar system and uh, beyond Neptune, there's a debris field called the Kuiper Belt. And uh, this Kuiper Belt is full of billions of objects, um, of icy objects that were left over from the formation of the solar system. And so we think the debris disks that we're seeing um, in these other solar systems are very similar to our um, Kuiper uh, Belt objects, but um, they are around much younger stars. So uh, this visualization shows you the locations of these um, 26 stars um, that they've discovered these debris uh, disks around. They're all relatively um, close to the sun, so within a couple hundred light years. And um, what we're doing is we're flying around and uh, seeing what um, each of these uh, debris um, disks look like. And, um, and these, you know, this is of course a visualization, a simulation. Um, they had to magnify these uh, debris disks um, tens of thousands, hundreds of, you know, probably millions of times in order to make them visible. Um, but you can see here an edge-on system, and we, um, there's also a number of face-on systems. And um, <clears throat> these are stars that are anywhere from tens to hundreds of millions of years old. 
So um, they're relatively young um, compared to our solar system, which is uh, four and a half billion um, years old. And, um, and this is probably the largest survey um, so far that, um, where they've managed to, de um, de to detect and um, observe with the same instrument, with the same telescope, a whole bunch of th these different objects. Now, <clears throat> these are uh, debris disks, meaning uh, this is just kind of leftover material from planet formation that's still in orbit around the star. And so they form um, like a donut or a torus. But what about planets? I mean, we've talked about planets, but so far um, we haven't actually seen any planets. So let's talk about um, what it takes to um, take pictures, direct pictures of planets around other stars. And this turns out to be uh, much more difficult um, just because, as I said before, planets are a lot dimmer than their parent stars. Um, they can be uh, billions of times um, dimmer in um, visible light, in the optical light that our eyes detect and see. But um, even in the infrared, um, they can be millions of times, um, to have perhaps um, hundreds of thousands of times dimmer. And so you really do need that coronagraph to, um, to black out or blank out the central star. And so here's one example of Beta Pictoris, um, where they were able to, um, and Beta Pictoris actually has a debris disk. And that's um, what the kind of the orangish red, um, yellow um, stuff flaring off to the sides are. Um, the, the disk is somewhat edge on. So um, we see it as kind of a flattened structure. And, um, and Beta Pictoris B, the small planet, that um, little bright um, point pinpoint close to the center was discovered um, very close um, to the star. But, um, and, and it takes, um, in, um, over to um, the <clears throat> upper right, you can see a dotted um, circle and that represents um, the size of Saturn's orbit around the sun. And so um, the location of this planet is roughly um, where um, Saturn orbits around our sun. But um, you see that, you know, even when we um, do this, we can only see planets that are relatively fur further out. Um, a, a, an Earth-like planet that orbits roughly at the same distance as the Earth does from the sun will be, still be lost in the starlight. <laughs> but so far, um, you know, many of our detections, and, and there, um, you know, most of our um, detections of planets around other stars have been um, via indirect means, and very few, just a very small percentage, have actually been where we've um, directly imaged them, like we're seeing here, where we actually take a picture of them. And, um, and it turns out that detecting more than one uh, planet in a, in, in a solar system is also extremely rare. There are actually only two other cases. So here is one example of a very young star known as PDS-70. And in 2018, astronomers announced a, um, a discovery of a planet. That's that um, kind of the bright blob to the lower left of the central blacked out region. And, um, and then you can see a um, kind of a distorted flattened um, disk. Again, this disk is somewhat edge on, but not completely edge on. Um, but um, just last year, other astronomers with better um, instruments were able to uh, detect a, another planet. So in addition to PDS-70b, they found PDS-70c and this other world um, is on the right circle in these images, and um, it was it's kind of hidden in the um, in that um, gas um, debris disk. Um, so um, it, it wasn't seen um, previously because it was kind of camouflaged by the uh, other glowing uh, material in the system. And then uh, the, the probably the most famous um, system is something known as HR8799. And um, it looks like I managed to not um, add the image in, um, to this, but uh, HR 8799 actually has four uh, gas giants. And so this is uh, the most uh, number of planets that um, we've taken a picture of, but I apologize for uh, accidentally deleting it. But uh, that takes us to um, our, um, the, the, the most recent um, announcement in the news, which came out um, just over a week ago. And uh, this was a, uh, an effort from um, European astronomers, and they took advantage of um, something um, similar to GPI, which is an American instrument on an American telescope. But this is the Spectral Polarometric High Contrast Exoplanet Research Instrument. 
or sphere. And this is um, an instrument that has a chronograph, just like the MG Pi, but it's located at the very large telescope, um, which is um, at the European Southern Observatory. And um, what they were able to um, do was to image a system known as Tycho 8998-760-1. And um, this um, star, Tycho 8998, is in a direction of the sky where um, it's uh, in that direction. Um, it's close um, <coughs> to the galactic plane. And there are just a lot of stars uh, visible in that direction. And so the um, even though you see a lot of points here, only two of these points are actually the planets. And um, it's those two. And those uh, the other points that you're seeing are actually background stars. So there are stars um, further away that just happen to be in the same vicinity as Tycho 8998. And so they got um, imaged as well. And this star um, turns out to be very similar to the size of our sun, so roughly about one solar mass, and it's about 300 light years away. Um, it's visible in the southern um, hemisphere, so it's not anything that we can see from the U.S. Um, but the, uh, those two planets are um, about, um, or Jupiter size, or actually they're larger than Jupiter size, so the inner one is about three times the, uh, the size, the diameter of Jupiter, and we think it's about 14 uh, Jupiter masses, um, and the outer one um, is about six times the diameter of Jupiter, and um, or, um, it has about um, six times the mass of Jupiter. And both of these um, are um, actually much, much further away than Jupiter. So the inner one orbits about 160 times further um, than the Earth does uh, from the Sun, and the outer one orbits about 320 times further than the um, the Earth does from the Sun. So here's a simulation of the orbits um, of those um, two planets around their parent star. And um, that um, inner yellow orbit is where Pluto would be if you were to transplant our solar system um, to the star. So these planets are definitely much, much further away than the planets in our solar system. And in fact, um, those two planets would roughly be equivalent to Saturn and Jupiter if Saturn and Jupiter were about 30 times further from our Sun um, than they currently are. And part of the reason why um, we see um, these worlds is because we're, um, these planets are relatively young and um, they still have a lot of heat of formation. Um, so they're glowing very strongly in the infrared and uh, that makes them uh, be much more visible. Um, um, and so, they, um, so they're easier to see than, um, than if we had swapped out um, or swapped in our solar system and we try to um, see Saturn and Jupiter, Saturn and Jupiter would be much, much dimmer and they would be harder to see because it would be much closer in. And so um, you would have to really do a good job of subtracting out the starlight to see our solar system. But with this particular system, it's um, much easier uh, to view. And um, now there's not much we can um, do um, with these results, astronomers um, have run uh, models um, and simulations to tell us um, some very basic properties of these planets, um, like you know what um, their sizes would be and how um, hot they um, will be, um, in order um, for them to um, you know to make some guesses as to their properties. But what's exciting about these sort of observations is that they lay the groundwork for uh, future telescopes. We have um, telescopes that are on the um, planning um, stages um, that are um, much, much bigger than the largest telescopes uh, that we currently have. And um, we will also be la launching the James Webb um, Space Telescope um, in next, late next year. And uh, with um, these future observatories, we'll be able to get much more information about planets like these, um, get information about their atmospheres, and um, get you know, and, and learn not only about how um, planets form, but um, how um, you know, reasonable um, it might be to expect life around other worlds. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Steve. Well, great, thank you, Katrun, and uh... We'll come back to Katrin for questions at the uh, the end of the program. 
So I'm going to take over the screen here and, uh, and go through a number of, of stories, maybe. <laughs> there we go. So uh, what I wanted to start with was a, a story that we actually uh, went into some depth on in the last two uh, presentations of 60 Minutes, and that's the, uh, the first crewed flight of the, uh, the SpaceX Crew Dragon vehicle. It's the first time that the commercial crew program for NASA has actually flown from Florida to uh, the International Space Station with a crew of astronauts on board. And so just to refresh your memory, uh, on May 30th, these two astronauts were launched to the ISS. So uh, Bob Benkin is, is on the left. He was a uh, three-time flyer on the space shuttle. And uh, Doug Hurley is on the right. He was also a three-time flyer on the space shuttle, including being the pilot on the very last mission of the shuttle in, uh, in 2012. So uh, the Crew Dragon vehicle is purchased or rented actually from uh, the SpaceX company by, uh, by NASA. And so this was the, uh, the beginning of actually being able to use this spacecraft as a taxi to carry astronauts from uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center in Florida up to the International Space Station. It stays docked to the station for up to, uh, I think, 210 days. And uh, it acts as a lifeboat during that time for the, the crew that flew to the station on it. And then uh, it brings them back home. So on uh, May 30th, this was the launch on board a SpaceX Falcon 9 uh, carrying Hurley and Benkin. And here they were, uh, their first broadcast from space in this brand new uh, human rated spacecraft. And the next day after launch, they uh, approached and docked with the ISS. And they joined the crew of one American and two Russians that were already on the ISS. So that brought the, the total crew up to much closer to the preferred uh, population. They, uh, in the past, have, have typically had six crew members on board. And uh, so one of the big things that's happened in the, the two plus months that they've been on the station is uh, uh, both Benkin and Chris Cassidy, the, the astronaut in the red shirt, uh, completed four extravehicular activities or spacewalks to complete uh, the change out of batteries on board the station, the, the main batteries that store all of the power from the uh, solar arrays. Um, and so the original batteries have been in place since the, the station was launched in the, uh, or assembled in the, the 2000s and uh, it was time to replace those. So they've uh, been over the last three years doing quite a few spacewalks to uh, install a couple of dozen lithium ion batteries, which replace the old uh, nickel hydrogen batteries. And they're much, uh, much uh, more uh, compact batteries. They, uh, they store a lot more um, electric power per, uh, per battery, and so they can make do with, uh, with far fewer of them. And so uh, there have been four separate uh, spacewalks with these two astronauts. Um, each one lasted between six and seven hours, and uh, they completed the installation of these batteries, something that was started uh, uh, in 2017. And so the next big thing that's going to happen is, uh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, this is just a nice view during one of these spacewalks that Bob Benkin took. So here's the main structure of the space station. This gold uh, covered uh, spacecraft is a cargo vehicle launched by the Japanese Space Agency. And here's the Crew Dragon right here um, docked to the ISS. And this is a little bit uh, closer view as well. So these are some of the laboratory modules on ISS. There's Crew Dragon and there's the, uh, the HTV, it's called, uh, the, the Japanese cargo vehicle. 
And so what's next, and this is just in a couple days, is uh, Mencken and Hurley will undock from the space station on August 1st. They'll spend about a day in orbit flying, uh, uh, testing out the, uh, uh, the Crew Dragon vehicle. And then on, uh, on August 2nd, they expect to splash down in the ocean just a, a few dozen uh, uh, miles off the coast of Florida. And right now there's a little bit of iffiness on the, the weather forecast. So there's one possibility they, uh, they splash down uh, on the east coast of Florida, uh, not too far from Kennedy Space Center. The other possibility is they splash down in the Gulf of Mexico, so on the west, uh, uh, off the western side of Florida. Um, either way, they're met within an hour by uh, a support ship. They stay in the in the capsule and uh, are hoisted aboard the ship, and then they're uh, they're uh, extracted from the the spacecraft. So the plan is once. Uh, they're back home safely for uh, the month of August and much of September. There'll be a very extensive engineering review of the spacecraft uh, to make sure it's behaved as expected. And then uh, tentatively in late September, the next crew will launch to the ISS and that will be uh, carrying three American astronauts and one Japanese astronaut and they will uh, remain on the space station for about six months. So uh, if you uh, are interested in this, pay attention to, uh, um, I'd, I'd go to someplace like spaceflightnow.com. They have regular updates on these missions that'll tell you, uh, give you an idea of when the, the splashdown is going to happen. And, uh, and then NASA TV will certainly be providing live coverage of that. So um, uh, potentially uh, uh, Monday or Tuesday uh, next week, this will be uh, occurring. Okay, so I wanted to give a, a really quick uh, update on two of the Mars missions that are uh, active right now. And I've promised people this for uh, quite a while for our regulars. The InSight mission was the most recent one to land uh, uh, a little less than uh, two years ago. It was. Uh, let me think, uh, Thanksgiving of 2018 is when it set down on Mars. And its primary goal is twofold. One, it has a meter on board, and so it's looking for Mars quakes and uh, uh, using that to uh, analyze what the interior of Mars is, uh, is, is composed of, what the structure is. And then the second experiment is this heat flow probe. Uh, there was a uh, uh, sort of a little pile driver that was uh, supposed to work its way or pound its way uh, subsurface by about five meters, so 15 feet or so deep. And uh, we've been talking about this for well over a year now, probably a year and a half, when they started to deploy this uh, probe. This is about the size of a, a large turkey baster. Um, it seemed to go into the surface at an angle and then it got stuck. It was uh, about uh, two thirds of the way uh, into the surface and about uh, uh, 10 or 12 centimeters of it was still sticking out. Uh, and so this was a view, they pulled the support structure off, they used the camera on the robot arm to get a close up view. And so in, this is the very top of the, uh, the thermal probe, this is the electrical and data cable that's connected to the main spacecraft. And here's the shadow of the, uh, the robot arm. So what they uh, attempted to do was use the robot arm to uh, push against the, uh, the thermal probe or the heat probe and, uh, and then let it hammer into the surface. And they thought that by, uh, by doing that, they'd uh, give it enough uh, friction against it that it would uh, burrow in successfully. And that seemed to work. It, uh, it actually got down almost all the way uh, where it would be buried. And then uh, they uh, tried an experiment with just doing some more hammerings. And lo and behold, the, uh, uh, the thermal probe backed out 
uh, from the, the soil. And uh, it almost toppled over, but uh, the, uh, um, luckily it stopped hammering before that happened. And so this is uh, some images from the robot arm camera of what that looked like. It's uh, much farther out than it was when they uh, first started uh, the process. And so the thinking was that it had actually hit sort of a crusty layer in the, in the soil uh, or subsurface and that it couldn't quite uh, uh, break through that. And so they did another experiment where they uh, uh, pushed with the robot arm on top of the uh, probe and uh, were able to push it uh, into the surface. But uh, then when they tried letting it go again, it started backing itself out. So uh, the thinking is that there's very, very loose material now that it, at least there's a pocket of this and there's not enough friction where the, uh, uh, the probe actually stays in place. It, it starts bouncing its way out of the surface. And so uh, here's a, a view after they thought maybe they'd gotten this done, but uh, you can see the, the uh, electrical cable uh, sort of wiggling here. And they've tried over and over again with the, uh, uh, the sample scoop pushing down on the surface to activate the little pile driver and it seems to still be just uh, bouncing up and down. And uh, here's the, they've pulled the, uh, the arm away and here's a view of, of where it is. So it's again, almost completely buried, but it's not going any farther. And uh, so this is a, a sketch of what the latest theory is, is they, they think this is uh, the area that it's actually successfully penetrated through now, the crusty uh, material called dura crust. And then it's got this very unconsolidated layer. It's very loose that it got in. And, uh, and they think after doing 900 strokes of the, of the pile driver, that uh, perhaps this has actually gotten very compacted now at the, at the tip of the thermal probe. And so for the moment, they're, uh, they're stuck. They need to use the arm for some other uh, experiments on the, on the mission. So they've backed off. They're continuing to, uh, to think about this, what else they can do. Um, the one thing that almost certainly they will do is try using the scoop on the arm to fill this, uh, this void, the, the hole at the very top of the of the area that the probe is uh, inserted in and uh, fill that with, uh, with surface material and then push down as hard as they can on the top. And that might provide just enough friction and force that it'll be able to break through this compacted area and, uh, and continue. So I just wanted to end with uh, just a couple pretty pictures. So this was only 10 days after landing, and this was a picture from the robot arm. Here's the, the arm, and the camera is up near the elbow on the arm. But here's one of the two solar panels on InSight. And you see it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a brand new spacecraft on the surface, so it's sort of uh, spanking new and clean. And here's an image that was taken uh, just in the last week. And you see the entire spacecraft is now covered with dust. And that's actually was expected. Uh, the atmosphere of Mars almost always has uh, some dust suspended in it. That's how you get this sort of peach colored sky. And uh, it uh, um, is coating, uh, slowly settling out and coating the, uh, the spacecraft and the solar panels. On past solar powered missions like uh, the Spirit and Opportunity, they were lucky enough that dust devils crossed over and it swept the solar panels clean again. So far, that hasn't happened on InSight, but uh, the mission itself is, uh, the spacecraft is designed to provide enough power for probably another six months to a year if the sedimentation rate from the atmosphere continues steady. If there's a huge dust storm like there was uh, that, that uh, ended up leading to the demise of, uh, of opportunity uh, 
two years ago, then um, that could be a problem. But at the moment, they've got enough power to continue the seismic experiment and to hopefully uh, come back and, uh, and work more on, on uh, the thermal probe. So that's where we are with that mission. It's uh, sort of the same old story that we've been saying for the last uh, uh, oh, year and a half or so. But uh, stay tuned. We'll see what happens uh, as they continue uh, this mission. So just a very quick update on the Curiosity rover. Uh, today is uh, day 2837 since it landed in, uh, in 2012. And uh, this is sort of a self-portrait of Curiosity. But where they uh, have been uh, exploring, they're partway up uh, this mountain in the center of the crater they landed in. And this is a view of an outcrop that caught the geologist's attention. And what uh, I want to do, this is actually a, a sort of a sandstone uh, formation. But I want to zoom in on this area. And uh, you see in the, the sandstone, there's these nodules uh, sort of sticking out of the, the top of, uh, of this uh, layer. And uh, these are you know, warts, I guess, uh, in the rock. But what these indicate to the geologists is this area was under water. Um, these, are, uh, these nodules form by uh, dissolved minerals precipitating into the into the bedrock and uh, then you erode some of the bedrock and leave these behind this is a very similar looking uh, situation to what the opportunity rover found uh, on a, a different uh, location on mars and that again was very uh, convincing evidence that that area had been very wet at some point in the past and so that was an exciting uh, finding but uh, Opportunity is on the move again. They've uh, been slowly approaching this mountain, and right now they're on this area. It's, uh, it's called the clay bearing unit, and that's uh, sort of capping the floor of the crater. But where they really want to get is up into this area. And this is what's called the, the sulfate uh, layers. And uh, this is going to be very different uh, geology than what they've been roving across for uh, uh, since they landed. And they're slowly moving off in this direction, but you see all of this uh, dark stuff here that's actually fairly thick sand deposits. And so they're not going to try climbing or uh, you know, going through the sand for fear that they get stuck. And so they're going to be heading over this way to skirt the sand and then climbing up sort of a, a nature's provided ramp to get to the top of this, uh, this uh, layer here. And then they'll be uh, driving along on the surface, collecting samples and spending at least the next year in, in that area. So they expect over the course of the next within the next two months to actually be um, on the, the, uh, the ridge here on top of that outcrop. And, uh, and then they'll, they'll be spending uh, their time selecting samples. And this will be a totally new type of, uh, of uh, uh, geologic setting for the, this mission. And so they'll uh, be spending a lot of time analyzing that. So I wanted to end there. Uh, again, it's uh, day 2837. So far they've driven almost 23 kilometers and returned a little over 700,000 images. So this is an ongoing mission. So I wanted to end with uh, what we're calling the summer of Mars. Um, if you can't tell, I'm, I'm sort of a Mars fanatic, but uh, there are not, uh, three, two missions on their way to Mars right now and one mission just about to launch. So I just want to do a quick recap on this. We talked about these last month, but the uh, United Arab Emirates uh, built a uh, spacecraft. Uh, actually, the spacecraft was built under contract by the University of Colorado uh, Lab for Atmospheric and Space Physics up in Boulder. 
and uh, it was launched on a Japanese uh, launch vehicle uh, just uh, a, a little less than two weeks ago. And it's uh, intended to study the, uh, the atmosphere of Mars. And uh, so here's a, a view of the spacecraft being uh, prepared for launch in a clean room. Um, just gives you an idea of how large it is compared to the, the people in the blue suits behind it. Um, and here's the, the launch vehicle. It's called uh, uh, an H2. It's built by Mitsubishi in, uh, in Japan. And uh, there's the launch. This was on uh, July 14th. And so it was a very successful launch. The spacecraft is on its way to Mars. It'll arrive in February. And uh, so far, everything is going just uh, perfectly. The, the spacecraft has checked out. They'll be uh, spending some time uh, um, making sure all of the instruments are uh, alive and well, and uh, just cruising to Mars for the next six months. So, and then uh, the second mission that uh, just got off the ground is uh, Chinese. And this is the first mission beyond the moon that China has attempted to uh, undertake. And so this is, uh, the mission is called Tianwen-1, which uh, translates to heavenly questions. And uh, this is actually a very ambitious miss mission. You see the spacecraft here. This part contains a lander and uh, it's attached to an orbiting spacecraft. So it's actually a two-part mission. It will first go into orbit, and then after a month or two, the lander will descend into the atmosphere and attempt a soft landing on the surface. And so this will come in uh, under rocket propulsion. Once it's on the surface, uh, uh, ramps deploy, and there's a rover attached to the top. This rover is a little bit smaller than what uh, Spirit and Opportunity were, so a, sort of a small golf cart uh, in size. And once it uh, uh, is ready, it will roll down the ramp and then uh, rove across the surface. And uh, they're hoping for about a 90-day lifetime for the, uh, the rover. And this is based on the, the rovers that uh, China has sent to the moon. Uh, it's a scaled up version of the, the U-2 rover, rovers. And so, uh, this uh, was just before launch. The, the uh, uh, assembly crew uh, got together to uh, have their picture taken with the, the spacecraft in the background. And uh, this was the launch vehicle. It's called a uh, Long March 5. It's the largest launch vehicle that uh, uh, China has available. And this was only the fifth time that it had, uh, had launched. And so there it is rolling out to the launch pad with the uh, spacecraft on board. And on the 23rd, so uh, just last week, it uh, had a very successful launch as well. So the Tianwen-1 is, uh, is safely on its way to Mars. It also arrives in uh, uh, late February and it will go into uh, orbit for, uh, as I said, one to two months and then uh, drop off the, uh, the lander. So stay tuned on, on that mission. And then finally, we get to uh, the United States uh, contribution to this race to Mars. Uh, this is the Mars 2020 rover. Um, it's, uh, the rover is now called Perseverance. And so this is an animation, uh, I'm sorry, an artist's uh, drawing of what this will look like on the surface. This mission is really intended to do uh, biochemistry at Mars. It'll be looking at the geology, but it's also got a suite of instruments that are very finely tuned to look for uh, signatures of biology, uh, either past or current. Uh, and by that, I mean they're looking for evidence that bacteria uh, either currently exist or, uh, or did exist in the past. And so once it's uh, on the surface, it's got uh, a sampling capability. It's going to collect core samples of these rocks. And uh, this is the first part of a very ambitious mission that'll be uh, going on over the next decade to actually return these samples to Earth. 
And so they'll be collecting them into these uh, sterilized sample containers. Over time, uh, uh, Perseverance will drop some of these off on the surface in, uh, in very uh, precise locations that, uh, that will be easier to find in the future. And uh, it will uh, continue on for uh, the, the, the plan is for at least one Mars year, two Earth years, and collect uh, roughly 40 samples. And, uh, and then in, uh, if everything goes according to plan, and uh, of course, if Congress funds this, uh, it's uh, so far so good. Um, in 2026, at the earliest, uh, two missions will launch to Mars. One will carry what's called the Fetch rover, which will be a, a, a rover roughly the size of Spirit and Opportunity. And it will uh, guide itself to land somewhere near Perseverance. And then once it's on the surface, it will go out and collect all of these uh, sample canisters. It will carry them back to the mothership that it landed on load them on an onboard rocket. The rocket will launch itself into Martian orbit. And then there's another spacecraft provided by the European Space Agency that will uh, pick up the sample canister and then launch itself back to the Earth. And so if all goes well, in 2031, these samples will be returned to laboratories on our planet. Um, one of the other Hitchhikers on this mission is a small helicopter drone that they'll be testing. And we'll certainly talk more about this as the time comes, but this is an exciting experiment just to see if, uh, if you can design a small helicopter that will operate in the, the Martian atmosphere. And so if you can't tell, we're leading up to the launch here. So this was over the last uh, couple of months. The, uh, there's the Perseverance rover tucked into its uh, what's called the aero shell or the back shell. Here's the uh, heat shield that protects it. And then this is the spacecraft cruise stage, which provides the, uh, the propulsion and, uh, and the, uh, all of the uh, systems to get the spacecraft to Mars. Um, the uh, heat shield and uh, aero shell were built by Lockheed Martin here in Denver. So major contributors to this mission. Um, so here's everything's all tucked up and uh, tipped over and ready to uh, go into the uh, payload fairings, which uh, are the, essentially the nose cone of the, the rocket that the spacecraft gets uh, protected by as it flies through the atmosphere. And so the, here they are ready to encapsulate the spacecraft. And uh, here it is uh, being the a launch pad. <coughs> Excuse me. So this was yesterday morning, uh, rolling the rocket out to the pad from the assembly building. And here it was uh, approaching the pad uh, late yesterday morning. And I wanted to zoom in on this area just because it always fascinates me. If you can see it on your screen, there's a sort of a spider web of cables uh, stretching between all of these uh, lightning rods. So there's two lightning towers and then one lightning rod on the, the uh, access uh, structure on the launch pad. But uh, what happens is the rocket, uh, when it takes off, it actually climbs right through the center of the spider web. And so it's, it's uh, the pad is protected from lightning strikes and then the rocket uh, uh, ascends right through the the hole in the in the cables, so uh, that I've always found uh, amazing that uh, that there's uh, that sort of engineering going on. So here's our uh, our payload fairing with uh, the spacecraft tucked away in here, and uh, here we are sitting on the launch pad. So this was uh, uh, sunrise this morning, I believe. And uh, here's a, a nice view again of the rocket on the pad. And so uh, tomorrow morning, for those of you that are real space buffs, you need to get up early, but uh, the launch window opens at 5.50 a.m. Mountain Time. And uh, we will be doing a, a program starting at 5 a.m. If you wanna hear more about this mission, uh, join us on the museum's Facebook Live page, but uh, 
If not, uh, check out NASA TV or, uh, or Space Flight Now for, uh, for updates on this. And uh, so the launch window is three hours long. So until uh, 8.50, anytime in that, in that window, they can uh, uh, lift off. But uh, the last weather forecast was 80% chance of favorable weather in the morning. And so um, there's the, the link for our Facebook uh, website. And we'll put that up again at the end of the program. But uh, we're on our way and uh, hopefully by, uh, by uh, this time tomorrow, we'll uh, be uh, ready to uh, say that we have the third spacecraft on its way to Mars. And um, incidentally, the, uh, the landing of Perseverance uh, will be on February 18th at about 1 p.m. Mountain Time. And so put it on your calendar and, and join us then. And so I just wanted to end up here with, uh, with this, uh, set of links if you if you want to uh, follow these any closer. And uh, before we go to Q&A, I just wanted to end on a personal note. Um, I've been involved in 60 Minutes uh, since 2001 when I uh, started at the museum and it was going on for uh, at least a year before that. And uh, Kachun has been involved uh, for many, many years as well, and Dimitri Klebe before that. Um, and uh, I just wanted to let you know, as of Friday this week, I'm retiring from the museum. Um, so I'm hoping in the future, I'm, I'm going to be back as a guest. And I certainly expect to be back for some of these special programs. But at least for the next couple months, I'm going to be in the audience along with, with all of you. And I just wanted to thank all of our staff that have been involved in this, people like Kim Evans, who's uh, who's running the technology tonight, Marta, Lindsay, um, and all of the people that have been appearing. And of course, all of you, you've, uh, you've been an amazing community that we've built up over the years. Uh, and uh, we really love having you as part of the museum family. We love bringing these programs to you. So uh, it'll continue. And uh, I look forward to, to seeing all of you when we're able to get together in person again. So thanks for all the support, and, and uh, it's been a it's been a wonderful ride. So I think at that point we should turn it over to Q and A. So we're going to try and uh, and uh, go through your questions. Katrun, why don't you start, and uh, and I'll try to um, select some as well. Right. Yeah. And, no, I'll just point out that um, there are a lot of um, comments uh, in the chat about your retirement, Steve. So uh, people are going to miss you. <laughs> well, I'm going to miss everybody too. It's been, uh, this has been a, a real highlight of my life for the last almost 20 years. So uh, and yeah, I mean, no one can fill your shoes and I'm not even going to try. So well, I want a blood oath from you and Naomi that you're going to do Mars updates every now and then. So. Okay. I'll, I'll pretend to do what I can. Okay. <laughs> All right, so um, I, I've um, seen some great questions in the chat, and so I'm going to um, go ahead and address um, some of them. And um, I'm going to share my uh, PowerPoint screen again. And um, remember, um, I had um, accidentally left out a, um, a, a, a graphic, and so here it is. This is um, that planetary system that I talked about that had, um, has four planets that have been imaged. And so this is um, this animation is based on seven years worth of data, and you can see um, three planets on the right, and there's a really dim one off to the left. And these planets um, orbit anywhere from 40 <coughs> to 100 years. Um, that's how long they um, take to um, go around the star HR8799. So I just wanted to um, get that out there because I made the mistake of, of leaving it out. But um, one of the questions um, that was asked in the chat is. Um, why um, do we have accretion disks? Why do, um, does material falling into a star always end up in a disk? And um, let's see if we can um, find my PowerPoint controls. <coughs> let's just go forward. And <clears throat> so here um, is that um, animation of that computer simulation that we saw earlier. And obviously you can see all the material in, um, in orbit 
is flattened into a disc, sort of like a dinner plate or a pizza. And this is actually a natural consequence of um, gas in the universe. Um, you know, what we're seeing is uh, basically um, angular momentum that, um, you know, there's some um, amount of spin in the gas. And uh, if you start out with a big um, gas cloud uh, that's not flattened, what will happen is that um, you can never get exactly zero angular momentum. There's always going to be some net spin that's left over. And so as the gas um, collapses, you know, um, gas that um, is spinning or moving or rotating or orbiting in one direction, their motion gets canceled out by gas that's moving in, um, in an opposite um, direction. And so over time, once you add up and cancel all of the uh, different gas and dust uh, motions, there will always uh, be some net spin or um, some net rotation. And so the, um, the accretion disk or the, um, the, the debris disk that we see is um, that, um, that flattened um, rotating disk is um, what's left over after you canceled out uh, the motions from, um, from everything else. And then um, I also had a question um, that it's actually a really good question that asked, um, you know, for um, this system, Tycho 8, 998, you know, I pointed out that um, the two planets are the ones that are off to the lower left of the star. So how do we know that those other points are not planets? How do we know that they are actually background stars? Well, what um, the astronomers did was they um, actually um, imaged um, and um, observed the star over multiple years in order to, um, so, so they didn't actually just observe it once. And I guess the brilliant thing about um, having Steve and I do uh, separate presentations is that I can actually go back and add stuff to my PowerPoint. And so um, what um, they did was they, um, they looked carefully at the motions uh, or the position of the, of the star in the sky over time. And so um, this is a plot from the paper the, uh, the, the white circles, um, mm. two white circles, and then there's also an orange circle um, to the left. Those are the positions of, of the star over time. And the, um, the blue dashed curly Q line is the expected motion of the star in, in the sky. Um, and, and that's just because the Earth is in orbit around the sun. And so we see, um, as a result of the Earth um, moving around the sun, we see um, this expected motion. And then um, the other observations are of um, the, the, um, the, the planet uh, positions over time. And you can see that those planet positions track the location um, of the star. So um, we know that um, the, those planet points are moving um, with the star and hence uh, they must be associated with the star. Whereas the other points of light that we see are um, not moving with the star and so they must be objects either in the foreground or the background um, that just happen to be in the same direction that we're looking. And then finally, another thing that we can do is um, we can observe um, these worlds in different um, wavelengths of light and, uh, and create um, models of what we would expect um, the emission from these planets um, to be. And so this is, um, what the results are, the, uh, the, the red um, squares, um, the squares that you see in the plot, uh, in the top plot, are the ob observed um, luminosities in um, different colors or different wavelengths of light um, in the infrared. And, um, and then the, uh, the, the gray and blue lines are models of um, Jupiter-like planets um, that are about um, 1200 um, degrees Kelvin and um, so they can um, create these models that show um, that the light that they receive in, from the star matches what you would expect from uh, a planet and not from um, a, a background star. So there are basically two different ways that they um, use to confirm that these indeed are objects um, that are attached to the star, that are in orbit around the star, and that these objects are uh, planet-like and not star-like. I'll stop sharing. And uh, Steve, um, do you have any questions? Um, yeah, I'll uh, try a few about Mars, and then we'll go back to you, Katrina, if you can select some more. Um, so there was one about uh, why can't they move the, the heat probe to a different location if they, they're just having problems? And the answer is there's 
just no mechanism to do that. Uh, initially, the heat probe was in this uh, housing that, uh, that was placed on the surface. And when they had problems, they were able to lift the housing off, but they realized that uh, there's no way that once the, the probe is out of the housing that it can actually uh, be manipulated by the robot arm. There's just no mechanism for that. And so it's, they're stuck where they are. They can't, uh, if it backed out far enough and fell onto the surface, there's just no mechanism for the arm to pick it up and and move it and, and start digging again. So that's, uh, that's not possible. Um, there's also a couple of questions just about the solar panels uh, on InSight, the, uh, the dust collecting of why can't those be cleaned off? And uh, it really comes down to, the, again, the design of, of the mission and the spacecraft. Uh, there's uh, sort of a motto that you don't want anything that overly complicates the, the spacecraft. And so for things like the dust on the solar panels, they know that that's going to happen. They design the spacecraft to have enough margin on the power system that uh, they uh, can operate for the duration that the mission is intended to, uh, to do its, uh, its investigation over. And so there's no way for the, the arm to dust it off. There's no mechanism for blowing the, the dust off. And that's just one of the downsides of solar powered spacecraft on Mars. But um, just to allay any fears, both Curiosity and the Perseverance uh, rovers are uh, uh, powered by a plutonium uh, generator, if you will. It's called a radioisotope thermoelectric generator. And so there's about 10 pounds of plutonium on board the spacecraft. The heat of the radioactive decay is converted into electricity. So they get about 100 watts of power out of that system. And that's enough to power the spacecraft uh, for many, many years. And so that's the, the mechanism there. And uh, I think there also was one about uh, whether from the International Space Station they'd be able to observe the Mars 2020 or any of the other missions in flight. And I don't think that's possible from the space station unless they happen to be uh, in sight of, uh, of Kennedy Space Center when it launches. They potentially could see the rocket climbing through the atmosphere. But then once the spacecraft is uh, detached or deployed, it's much too small to uh, see with the instruments on board the station. There are ground-based telescopes and space-based telescopes that can see these things. And I think there was an image released just a couple days ago of the Chinese uh, mission just causing a streak against the star background that was uh, collected by a, an orbiting telescope. So uh, that's the answer to that. Kachun, do you have a couple more questions you want to tackle? Yeah, I was uh, just looking through the chat and uh, um, there were a couple questions that um, not completely related to what I talked about. One question um, was about um, where do comets um, come from or how do they form? And, um, and I'd shown uh, pictures of or some movies of comets um, plunging close to the sun. Well, comets are um, one of the easiest descriptions um, that I um, have of comets, or at least I imagine what they're like, is to, um, that they're dirty snowballs. So comets are made up of ices uh, mixed with um, some dust and dirt. Um, and um, they come, um, at least um, currently, from the outer reaches of the solar system. And that's just because you know, the, those are the places that are cold enough for comets to exist. And um, when the orbits bring them in close um, enough to the sun, um, the heat from the sun um, starts to evaporate the ices and, um, and material um, starts to stream off of comets. And so um, currently there's um, Comet Neowise, uh, which many of you might have heard of. That's something that you can see uh, immediately after sunset. It's below the dip, uh, Big Dipper if you look up, off to the Northwest. Um, unfortunately, uh, for people living in the city or in Denver uh, or in the suburbs, um, that's, it's actually kind of hard to see just because of the light pollution. You have to kind of drive um, well away from the city lights. Um, so so that, that's how we can see um, comets today is if they get close enough to the sun. But we also think that comets are a leftover of um, the debris that was in the solar system um, after, um, you know, 
while everything um, was forming the, the planets. And so there was material left over, and at least in our solar system, comets um, were gravitationally flung out into the uh, further reaches of our solar system by the giant planets, especially Jupiter. And then um, I think that, um, there's also one unconnected question about the star Betelgeuse, and if there's any news about Betelgeuse, uh, Betelgeuse is a super red giant. It's located uh, about 500 light years away, and over the last nine months or so, um, it's been dimming so that um, at its minimum, um, it was down to about 40 percent of its maximum or what was its average brightness, and people were thinking that um, it might be about to go supernova. There were some uh, results, some observations uh, a few months ago, which suggested that uh, Betelgeuse was dimming because it was releasing copious amounts of dust, and that um, this dust was occluding or blocking uh, the light from the star. But um, some more recent observations, actually from just this past month, um, were um, astronomers using um, extremely high frequency um, radio telescopes. They uh, also observed a dimming um, when they compared their observations to historic observations that were taken uh, multiple years apart. And so if um, Betelgeuse was releasing dust from its outer atmosphere, you actually wouldn't expect um, the dimming to be visible and to occur in the radio waves as well. Uh, but since they were seeing it in these high frequency radio waves, that suggests, according to these astronomers, um, it's not dust, but it's actually star spots. And so, um, you know, we know the sun has, has sunspots, and we've also observed um, star spots and other um, stars. But for Betelgeuse, um, it might have these giant star spots that might cover anywhere from 50 to 70 percent of its surface. So that's what's happening with Betelgeuse. And back to you, Steve. All right. Well, we had one question about the, the pictures I showed of the, uh, the Mars 2020 spacecraft being sealed in this huge payload fairing, and why is there all this empty space? And I think the answer is the payload fairings are more or less off-the-shelf items, and they come in several different sizes, but it's usually, uh, they, they call them like uh, three and a half meter fairings, which would be three and a half meters in diameter, or four meter or five meter. And uh, those each have a, a, a fairly proscribed uh, length based on the type of spacecraft that normally use them. And so the one that's being used on the, on the 2020 mission, the spacecraft itself is quite uh, wide. It's not very tall, but quite wide. And so it needs the widest one of those uh, payload fairings that's available. Usually those uh, carry one or two communication satellites. So you have the spacecraft stacked one on top of each other, more or less filling the mobile volume. But in this case, uh, Mars 2020 is near the bottom of that and you've got all this uh, empty space. So it, it's unfortunate they can't just carry another uh, mission to Mars, but uh, it is it is what it is. And uh, that's basically, what they, they needed for that. Um, and there uh, also was a uh, question, and I'm sorry, I, it's gone straight out of my head, um, about, uh, ha, about how long ago was the, uh, the, the water there on, uh, that I showed on the curiosity view of that outcrop that had the little nodules. And if I knew the answer to that, Exactly, I'd I'd be uh, probably one of the most popular Mars scientists in the world. But uh, we know that there was water there. We believe that it was early in the in the history of the planet. But uh, the big question still outstanding: are when was it there? How long was it there? And uh, we're still investigating about what caused the Martian uh, atmosphere to leak away. What caused uh, the uh, environment to turn from a, a warmer, wetter planet to a, a much uh, uh, drier and cold one. And uh, there's one mission that's orbiting right now called the MAVEN uh, mission, again, uh, uh, run by the University of Colorado. And they've been investigating the, the uh, uh, atmosphere leaking away into space 
since the beginning of that mission. And so there's lots of stories to tell there, but I think that's an idea for a, a future program at the museum is to have the, uh, the principal scientists from that mission come down and, uh, and uh, update us on, on all the findings of that. But um, we're, we're learning a lot. We have a lot more to, uh, to uh, find out still. And uh, there was also a question about when are we sending people, if, if that's still in the plan. And uh, I think all I can say is if we stay on the current course and we actually get back to the moon in the mid 2020s, there's a possibility of, uh, of sending people mid to late 2030s, probably late, at the, it would be more realistic. But uh, there's a lot of a lot of development has to happen before that. And uh, I think the first stop in the current uh, planning is to, to send astronauts back to the moon and, uh, and establish a, at least a human tended base on the moon where we would have a fairly regular uh, crew uh, staying uh, on the surface. And until that uh, happens, we'll, uh, we won't be going much beyond the moon with people. So Kachun, I'll let you jump back in. Yeah, so uh, there was a question about, um, you know, if we are observing um, wavelength signatures of Jupiter-like planets to uh, verify the identity uh, of a planet, to verify that they are indeed planets, um, can that tell us something about the composition of the planet? And uh, for in, in this case, in which um, we are receiving um, just light um, at very, um, what are called um, these, of wavelength windows, um, it doesn't um, really tell us um, too much. I mean, we can confirm with our models, um, like the uh, the plot that I showed earlier, that a Jupiter-like planet um, at, at a certain temperature can give off light at those specific wavelengths to match um, the, um, the luminosities that we see at those wavelengths. To um, get a lot more information, what um, you would actually like to do is to get more um, detailed information uh, at uh, very detailed wavelengths, uh, meaning um, doing more spe spectroscopy. And um, we can do that in some cases, not with these worlds, but in uh, planetary systems where the, uh, the disk is actually edge on like this instead of face on. And uh, in those cases, if a, um, a planet actually passes in front of its parent star, then um, you can actually um, get um, observed starlight through that planet's atmosphere and uh, the atmosphere will imprint sort of like fingerprints um, its signature and um, and we've done that um, for um, some uh, planets using the Spitzer Space Telescope and it's expected that with the James Webb Space Telescope you'll know, be able to do that as well and so um, we'll be able to really sample um, the atmospheres of these planets and when you know what these atmospheres are made up of, you can um, have a lot more clues as to um, what the composition of the rest of the world is like and um, how it formed over time. And then finally, um, there's also one um, last question about um, the fact that we've um, discovered so many disks around stars. What's the latest estimate on the prob probability of planets forming around stars? And uh, I'm not a... Um, Planet Hunter, um, but I, um, given what I've seen over the years, I, was, I don't know what the latest uh, numbers and statistics are, but um, it does seem like, um, you know, um, a good fraction of the stars in our galaxy um, have planets. Um, currently, the way that we're detecting planets is biased in the sense that we're not finding all the planets um, that are in a particular uh, star system. We're only finding the ones that are easiest to find. And that means the largest planets, the planets that orbit closest, um, or at least in, um, one of the indirect techniques that we use to find planets, those can find large planets close up to a star, whereas it's a lot harder to find planets further away. The um, techniques that I was talking about um, just now, um, tonight, um, they are good for spotting young uh, planets that are very hot, that are further away, but uh, they are obviously aren't finding planets up close. So right now we still don't quite know what the statistics uh, planets are, um, but um, the chances are, you know, probably good that um, a good fraction, you know, um, 
and I'm just kind of randomly pulling out numbers that I think are of the right order of magnitude, but um, don't expect them to be, to be completely correct, you know, but anywhere from 20 to 40 to 50 percent um, of the stars out there probably have planets. And um, based on some of the statistical surveys that have been done, um, we think that um, you know, up to 25% of the um, stars in our galaxy that are um, sun-like stars could have Earth-like planets. So there are definitely um, a lot of planets out there, but uh, there's still a lot of work to be done to really nail down um, how many planets there are. Steve? Okay, I'm going to end on one last Mars question. <laughs> That was, how did they choose where the thermal probe was uh, going to be uh, placed on the InSight mission? And the, the general landing site itself was very carefully chosen as one of the least populated by rock areas on Mars. So they expected it to be just soil uh, with very few rocks. And the, the uh, intent for that was they didn't want to start digging and run into a, a rock that's just below the surface. And uh, instead, what they seem to have run into is, first of all, this dura crust, the, the crusty layer. And they've only seen very thin exposures of that before. And in this location, it's apparently a couple tens of centimeters thick. So that was unexpected. And then this very loose unconsolidated material that they think they've run into below the Dura crust. That hasn't been seen at any of the other landing sites before. So uh, partly it's bad luck <laughs> what, what's happened here. They, uh, they've run into multitudes of, uh, well, multiple issues with uh, getting this probe in. And uh, it, uh, there's still a chance that it will bury itself, but in its current position, it does not provide any useful information. But the spectrometer, I'm sorry, the seismometer has been working spectacularly. So uh, the mission is still, uh, is still successful in that uh, realm. So I think at that, um, it's time to call it a night. So uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us tonight and for all the great questions. Thanks, Kachun, for uh, your expertise on this, and Kim for keeping us online. And uh, everyone, stay safe, and we'll see you again at some point in the future. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Steve. Yep, been a pleasure. <laughs>